I'm Murray Carter. Welcome to Carter Cutlery's High Performance Tips. We're at Douglas Ridge Rifle Club with world champion shooter Stan Pate. Stan, you're not only a national but also a world champion. Mm -hmm. You have over 12 national shooting records, mm -hmm. eight of which are still standing. I believe so, that's correct. Yep. Uh, you can be seen featured on YouTube for uh, savage long-range shots mm -hmm. where you make a shot with a three-weight, a rifle that most people think is a good for only 800 yards. Mm -hmm. You shot almost close to 1,200 yards and hit your target. Right. Shot after shot. Is that, with absolute confidence. Mm -hmm. You were uh, placed third in the world at the 2009 Bisley Championships mm -hmm. in had England. A good, had a good match. And just up until recently, until you, until you passed the baton on to the next guy, you were the captain of Team Savage Rifle Team. That's correct. Yeah. What, what a, a, impeccable credentials. And uh, you, you just know so much about shooting, it's incredible. And we want to glean into some of that today. We want you to share some of your knowledge with us. We want to start, though, by uh, asking you some basic questions like, you know, how old were you when you first started to shoot? Oh, I was really young, Murray. It was actually my sister that taught it, me and my twin brother how to shoot, which is kind of an odd story for, for most guys. Yeah, that it? sure is. Well, it is. My sister's a deadly shot. She really is. And, uh, but it, I think we were probably about five or six when we first started shooting. That was handgun. And, if, and around uh, eight or eight, we we got pellet guns, and around ten, we had our own twenty-two rifles. Wow, that would be almost unheard of in today's culture. Mm -hmm. Oh, we used to go hunting by ourselves at ten. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. So, what was your uh, your first impression when you shot a gun, like uh, you know your first uh, high-power handgun or your first high-power rifle? It uh, for me, it it was it was endless opportunities, if you will. As a kid growing up in, in a rural setting, I grew up in, in southwestern Oregon, a little logging town, all of a sudden I could hunt deer. I could hunt these things. I could go hunting camp with my dad or, or with the family. I could, I could get involved in a lot more aspects of our lives that I couldn't do before, before having, having that firearm. But also for me, it opened up an area to explore. I was able to take up some, some target shooting or planking, as we called it back then. Uh, 22 shells were cheap, ammunition for centerfire was cheap, and it opened up just an area of endless possibilities. Well, it sounds like you had a lot of fun when you were, when you were young. I did, I did. And how did shooting factor into your life from that time forward? Well, shooting's been a part of my life ever since. Uh, when I lived in Alaska, of course, you know, you hunt and fish, that's, that's the, the pastime up there. And later on, when I went in the Marine Corps, uh, it really factored in. It, I did really well at the range at, at Pendleton when I went to, to boot camp, and it pretty well set uh, the mold for what was going to be the rest of my life in the Marine Corps. And I ended up shooting for the Marine Corps, so it carried me on into that. Of course, I refined skills then, people like Jack Caseman and Gunnar Driggers and Gunnar Quandel and those people that gave me the skill set. They taught me what I needed to know for competition shooting. Okay. And ever since then, I've been able to just uh, take what they taught me and expand it just a little bit and a little bit and a little bit, and it gets better. So you were a, com a competitive shooter in the Marine Corps. That's correct. And what have been some of the most rewarding accomplishments during your shooting career? The probably, Murray, for me, the biggest compliment, or uh, compliment, the biggest, uh, biggest uh, thing for me in shooting is it happened at the World Championships, but it wasn't winning a medal. The metal got me to that point. I was able, for the first time, things became so clear to me, all the people that it took to get me to this point. You're on a, pod you're on a podium, you got a gold medal around your neck, and people are clapping for you. All the, the best of the best in the world are clapping with you. And for me, it was, it was the self-realization that there was all these people that got me to that point, and now I have the mechanism to talk to school kids about how they can win, how they can accomplish great things by whatever mechanism they choose. Wow, if only your sister knew what she was getting you into. Oh God, yeah, <laughs> she, has, she has an idea, she really does. Uh -huh. My sister's brilliant, but I don't think she knew at the time the, the multiplication factor that was going to happen in my life. In fact, there's so many people that had contributed. 
that they, when I went back and talked with them afterwards, they didn't even remember the conversations, but it had pr profound effects on me. Wow. What, what have been some of the most challenging moments of your shooting career? Uh, God, just progressing to the next step. There, there's a frustration. Shooting is a mental sport. Uh, and I typically tell people that shooting is 95% between the ears. The other 5% is in your equipment, your loading, all that. It, your self-belief system is what limits how far you're going to go with this sport or any other thing that you endeavor to do. And shooting especially, there's only so much you can accomplish with your reloads, so much you can accomplish with your rifles. But you'll find, and many people will bear this out, once you shoot a good score, it's not twice as easy to shoot that score again. It's ten times easy to shoot that score again. Kind of like you've broken, broken this mental barrier that you had. Exactly. So, you've, But to do that, you have to put yourself out there. You have to take that risk. You have to go shoot it in front of people and with people. And, and you have to go through that learning process. I'm guessing you can't do that from your sofa. No. <laughs> you've got to get out and do it. And you get out and do that by people like here at the gun club who are great shooters. But you know what? When you hang around people that are great shooters, they'll drag you along. They'll tell you what you need to know. They'll give you the self-confidence. They'll tell you what you're doing right. And they'll bring you up. They'll bring you up. Now, shooting is only one aspect. You know, it could be whatever your endeavors are. But for me, it was shooting. And these people, you talk about some of the nicest people. You go to a gun club, you have people that their handshake still means something. If they tell you to tell you they're going to do something, guess what? They'll do it even if it's to their detriment. Yeah. I'm guessing it, it has a little something to do with the gun culture. You know, a, mm -hmm. an armed person is a confident person. An armed person is a polite person. Mm -hmm. An armed person doesn't really have too much to be fearful of. And, and uh, you know, they don't have to hide behind some kind of, you know, false identity or right. uh, ego. Or So I understand what you're saying. I've mm -hmm. experienced that as well. Just even uh, earlier today, we were out there in the range at a thousand yards, and we had our we had our agenda what we were going to cover for mm -hmm. filming, and uh, one of the members said, "Hey, uh, Murray, have you ever shot a Palma rifle?" And I hadn't. He said, "Well, here's my jacket, here's my glove, here's the sling, here's the rifle, here's my ammo, which I hand loaded. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. and uh, just perfectly trusting." And he actually pulled targets in the pits one thousand yards away. Well, I was in some other area where he couldn't see, he couldn't supervise, and I was using his, you know, thousands of dollars of equipment. It happens all the time. Yeah, and that was a great experience. And, and <clears throat> you know, while we're at it, I just want to say, Douglas Ridge is a really beautiful range. It's easy to navigate, easy to get around. It's really roomy. It's in a r beautiful rural setting. You got trees all around. Mm -hmm. the, the grass is well kept. The, the, the grounds are, are well maintained. This is a really beautiful club and and actually I endorse it so uh, heavily that I'm going to become a member from today submit my application hope be glad to, to have hope, you hope to shoot here uh, frequently Stan today we shot at three different distances mm -hmm. 300 yards 600 yards and a thousand yards some would call that long-range shooting in your mind describe the term long-range in terms of hunting situations, tactical situations, and target shooting situations. Okay, if, if you don't mind, I'll go backwards on that. Okay. And we'll start off with, with, uh, with target situations. There, and long range, by definition, is a personal definition. I like to say it that way, because it's relative to what your perception is of long range. Uh, here we shoot back to 1,000 yards. That's usually considered long range by anybody. Uh, but for some places in the Midwest, in the East, uh, 600 yards is about as long as most ranges are, maybe even 300 yards. So that would be considered long range for that particular area or region. So, but, so target is you're typically limited by the calibration of your rifle, the velocity of your bullets. I mean, we shoot back, we have shot back further than 1,200 yards in competition, in organized competition. Uh, some of our rifles are capable, and 308 are capable of shooting back past 1,400 yards. It depends wow. on atmospheric conditions and elevation things. Uh, with our 338 Lapuas, we can shoot well beyond a mile. Are but, there any formal competitions where people shoot out to a mile? Oh, yeah, there's organized mile matches. Uh, they were supposed to have one down before the shot show this last year, but it didn't happen. Now, for tactical, going stepping back down, Tactical is also another one of those subjective terms. Typically shot with a gas gun or semi-automatic, as they're called, 
or a bolt action with a shorter barrel, more dual purpose. It can be called a sniper rifle, a tactical rifle, uh, could be a glorified hunting rifle. Uh, those you can shoot anywhere from 15 yards to back to a thousand if you have your loads correctly. But also they shoot them back what we would call, what I would normally call intermediate ranges back to 600 yards, 600 meters like that. It's where they really shine. After that, the, the, uh, the pendulum starts tilting towards the target rifle where you have greater velocities. Now for hunters, and here's where I like to make a, a significant differentiation. For hunters, uh, I shoot back to a thousand as probably as much as anybody out there, arguably. I limit my hunting shots personally to 300 yards. Well, why is it? That's a 700 yard discrepancy. There is, but out to 300 yards, I can absolutely say that where I put those crosshairs and I've made the adjustment for it is where that bullet's going to hit. With absolute certainty. Absolute certainty. It will be in that zone to where the, the debt I owe that animal when I decide to take it, that animal needs, when it dies, it needs to be now. It doesn't need to suffer, run off, and, and fall down and, and take us hours to find it. So you're concerned with the, the most humane shot you can make possible. You owe it. You yeah. owe it to the animal if you're going to take it. As you get back past 300 yards, I don't care who you think you are, you might be pretty sure that you can make that shot, but I know for all the different things out there that can happen. All the variables. Can, oh, the atmospheric conditions, wind conditions. Fatigue. Fatigue, moisture in the air. Mm -hmm. you, pick, you name, the, you name the, the reason, but you start opening up that group anyway, and it becomes a much less ethical shot. And also, if you haven't done that shot, repeatedly on the range, you have no business taken out in the field. Okay, so it's, it's a matter of uh, where pe people's level of ethics is, mm -hmm. you know, whether they think that uh, shooting at, say, an antelope or an elk, you know, at up to a thousand yards, you know, is, is they see it just as a kind of like a target, a challenge, mm -hmm. versus being absolutely certain that you can pinpoint and place your shot exactly in a perfect killing zone. Uh, I, that's my personal belief, yeah. and I understand that. So. I, I, it's not to impose my ethics on somebody else. Sure. But that is my personal belief. Well, well God bless America. Everyone yeah. can make their own choice. But Absolutely. Your, yours certainly makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that most, I think most uh, hunters would, would uh, understand what you're saying there. Well, and I can say we hold the national record for 1,000 yards. Mm -hmm. So it must mean we know a little bit about how to do it. But I can't positively tell you that I can lay down 1,000 yards and my first round is going to be in the mm -hmm. X ring. Well, that brings us to another topic because when you're shooting long range, for most people that's going to mean using some kind of optics mm -hmm. on the rifle. Now, you can choose optics for different reasons. And same reasons, we've got optics that are optimized for hunting, mm -hmm. tactical situations, and target. Just talk about that a little bit. Well, and, and they could be the same, but they can tend to be quite different. If you're looking for an optic for a tactical situation, it, it depends whether you're doing CQB work where, you know, where you're close in, moving in. Then you use something like the EOTech that's on your rifle or an aim point, a delta point from a pole, any of those. Uh, you'll use typically a red dot, some type of, of quick aiming system where you can act and react. That's all close in. If you're the tactical shooter, say for a CERT team, uh, you'll use a more high power scope where you have a very defined aiming point, a little higher magnification, a little more adjustment, a little ease of operation. Things like that. Waterproof, of course. It's maybe, just a, maybe a little range estimation exactly. feature as well. Right. And, it, it, you know, the proliferation of range finders is kind of aiding in this. But they're a two-edged sword as well yeah, with the lasers going, setting everything up. Well, can you explain what, <clears throat> what could be the disadvantage of using a, a laser range finder? Well, they can, you, in certain situations, you can be spotted using a range finder. It depends on what, what your opposition or who you're, you're trying to interdict in a law enforcement situation sure. or a military situation, and they can pick up that a, range, a laser has just been set off in the area. Now they're alerted to the fact that you're there. Oh boy, that could be a handicap. It could be a big handicap, especially if you're by yourself or one other person. It, you don't have the backup. Mm -hmm. But anyway, a tactical scope, uh, usually uh, a lighter magnification, it's not real big magnification like you would use on a target scope. You usually have a larger field of vision so you can take more in, you can see what's happening around sure, your sure. target. In a competition that would allow you to see a target pop over here and start walking this way that you have to shoot or walk, popping up over here and going left to right. 
uh, for targets, uh, target shooting, that could be all the way up to, say, the Night Force 42 power, 12 to 42. And that, a much more restrictive field of view, it's uh, the, the uh, light transmission is, is more of an issue with that. Not, it's good, don't get me wrong, but it takes more to get the same light transmission. The Night Force does that very well. Leupold does it with their fixed powers, things like that, and their, uh, their Mark IVs. But those will be for target use, where you can shoot back to back past a thousand yards. The the gentleman, the English guy that won the, uh, I'm messing up his name right now. So I just said that he uh, he was shooting a, a Leopold Mark IV that won the world championships, which is a tactical scope. Technically a tactical scope. But he yes. used it for target shooting. Yes, and did very well. Uh, effectively. Yeah, very nice guy too. If you ever ever meet him. But that's that's the English guy. The English guy with no name. With no name. <laughs> okay, if I Sorry, ever meet an English guy, this, we're I all apologize. Nice. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's kind of the the difference on it. He can uh, he can make a comment right down below in our YouTube section there and say, "I'm the guy." Feel free to hammer me. <laughs>
And that makes all the difference when you're shooting out to 1,000 yards. Yeah, and we seat the bullets to within a half mm -hmm. hour of each other seating depth, overall length. So at, <clears throat> at 1,000 yards with your best hand loads, what, what has been some of your tightest, you know, five-shot groups at 1,000 yards? Oh, there's not a one of us on the team that hasn't shot under two and a half inches at 1,000 in practice. Not necessarily a match, but in practice. So that, that would be a one-quarter MOA. Yes. That's awesome. Yes. At 1,000 yards there, with all the wind and everything else. And everybody that's doing what I'm doing is, is shooting that well. I can shoot one MOA mm -hmm. through my Savage Model 12 at 100 yards. Mm -hmm. but We'll get you better. <laughs> You're the master at knife making. We'll, yeah. We'll get you tightened up on the shooting. <laughs> A little bit would be fine. Stan, I'm, I'm real bad about keeping records when it comes to shooting because for me it's just been kind of a <laughs> relaxation and a hobby. But now you've really impressed upon me that if you want to be a winner, if you want to really improve in this discipline, you really got to keep good records. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's paramount importance. Uh, and, and, and competition shooting is very important. If you're a, a law enforcement shooter, it's paramount. I mean, lives depend on it. Competitive shooting, uh, it is so important to make that first shot count. Many of our places that we compete, we have convertible ciders. So those first two shots are, are ciders. If you can convert those and save throwing those other two rounds down range where you've increased your chances of dropping a point, you're better off. Well, the, about the only way you can do that is to have a, a data book and keep it current. In my data book, I go in and I try to find the same distance, often the same range if I've shot at that range before, and I look to see what the atmospheric conditions were, what the starting uh, elevation and settings were for my rifle and what the endings were. And I'll try to use those to put my first rounds in the X ring. The, if I can do that, then I can convert those two shots and save two shots at the end. Saves wear and tear on my rifle, saves uh, the opportunity to start dropping points because having fired more, range, uh, more rounds at, at a longer range. And having those records allow you to do that? Yes, it does. Yep. Because you can go back and find for a given range under the same atmospheric conditions that you're shooting in, this is what your rifle did. Okay, so it's all about the predictability. Mm -hmm. And uh, the more often you, you shoot uh, in different conditions, different atmospheric conditions, different elevations, mm -hmm. different temperatures, right. and you keep that all on record, then when you encounter a near similar mm -hmm. uh, conditions, you can predict with greater accuracy what the bullet is going to do out of the barrel. Exactly. And one of the reasons that works is because through the methodology of keeping that, you become attuned to what those conditions are. And you become attuned to what this, the change in those different conditions has on the effect of your rifle and your, your ammunition. So for if you go to a range or whatever the situation, let's say hunting even, and you've got this condition and you say, I recognize that, okay, and this is where I should set it at, but I have a little bit more moisture in there than I did before and you know that's gonna make the air denser, you hold it up just a little better. You come up one eighth of a minute on your scope and guess what, you're right, because you became attuned to how that works. So do competitive shooters or law enforcement officers, they sit on the sofa and they kind of review their logbook every now and then, their data book, just to they refresh? Should. Yeah. They should, They're, especially when lives depend on it. I mean, we're out here as a sport. Nobody, nobody dies if we're off by a quarter of a minute. In law enforcement, somebody's life, I mean, if I was a hostage, I would like to think that person has done that due diligence and I, if I stand still enough, then he has an opportunity. Wow, wow. Now, speaking of that, in the law enforcement scenario, you know, the, uh, the, the law enforcement shooter or designated sniper, mar designated marksman, he isn't going to have the opportunity to have those sighting in shots. He's got to make his first shot count. Yeah. We call that, we call that a cold bore shot. Cold bore shot, yeah. But tell me the Im importance of understanding the concept of cold bore shots in both tactical and in hunting situations. Well, and even in, in target situations. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not uncommon for your first shot of the day to hit in a slightly different place. Well, why is that? Well, your barrel's cold. It doesn't have any heat in it. It hasn't been fired. Uh, I'm assuming that you already foul the barrel at some previous time in preparation. Uh, most shooters that, that shoot a lot know that to keep their barrel fouled. Okay, so, well, we're going to have to talk about that earlier because that there is a can of worms. A lot of people think yeah. you've got to absolutely scrub 
your rifle after a day at the range. I we'll talk about that later. Rarely though. do. We're talking about cold shots now. Right. But uh, in, a, in a cold bore shot, it's not uncommon. Like your bullet to hit, say, a quarter minute one way or a half a minute the other way. Well, in a target situation, again, nobody dies if that happens. In a hostage situation, somebody's life may depend upon it. What we advocate and what is the common practice is you go out here on a given day, my first round of the day will be a cold bore shot. I am very careful. I get it, say, at the 300-yard line, I put on my 300-yard line dope. I very carefully call, make sure that shot is perfect, and then I record where the round hits. If it hits there repeatedly, I know that that's where my round is going to hit every time. So I can either adjust my sights for my first round and then adjust them back for my second, or I can hold off that same distance on it. But it, it's not uncommon for that to happen. That's called the cold bore shot. Yes. And everybody should know out of their rifle where that first cold bore shot is going to yep. go. Law enforcement hunters should know. Mm -hmm. Stan, conventional wisdom states that after you go to the range, you got to scrub your firearm down, oil it up, and try to get it back squeaky clean like in brand new condition. And that's going to extend the life of your firearm, extend the life of your barrel. But I've learned recently that's not always the case. Can you expound on that a little bit? And you're, exa you're absolutely right. If you're going to store the rifle for a period of time afterwards, you, you say you, it's the end of hunting season, you've shot it, whatever, you're going to store it, and it, it might be months and months and months before you're going to shoot, yes, absolutely, you need to clean it, put it away. Uh, if it's a rifle that you're going to shoot again in a match next week, or this or that, it's not necessarily true. In, uh, in my personal, my, my, uh, my target rifle, it'll soften four or 500 rounds for between cleaning. I clean after a match. And then I go out and I make sure I foul the barrel again in practice before the next match comes up. And the reason being, and there's many reasons for it, uh, I shoot a factory rifle in a, in a, in a uh, aftermarket rifle where you have a lapped barrel. In other words, the barrel is much smoother on the inside. Uh, it becomes less of an issue, but it's still an issue. It takes a while. It's called shooting in your bore. Shooting right. in your bore. Right. You, and you, you take and you shoot the rifle. And it, it actually feels in the little crevasses and little imperfections, maybe as little scratches in your barrel. And what will happen is you'll see your groups tighten up. That's when you know that you have your barrel shot in, is shooting in. And at that point, you're getting the best accuracy out of your rifle possible. When you first scrub your barrel, you're not. Things are still seating back in, settling back in. Things are filling up. Things are smoothing out. And your group will actually be much bigger. Hmm. That's interesting. It's typical. There's a kind of an opposite parallel there. Uh, sometimes when people use ceramic rods for sharpening their blades, the more those ceramic rods get filled in with metal particles mm -hmm. and so on, the less abrasive they are. Mm -hmm. But in the case of a barrel, you kind of want it to be kind of filled in. You want all those nooks and crannies filled in so that you get a consistent and smooth passage of the bullet down exactly. the bore. Exactly. Yep. Makes a huge difference in accuracy. And, and, and less galling of the copper jacket of the bullet. Mm -hmm. yeah. With all of the things that you've learned over your long career of shooting, which would span how many years, Stan? Oh, since the early 80s. Yeah, for, for competition, it'd be since the early 80s, oh, okay. 81. I was going to say, you probably weren't five or six years old in the 80s. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. We're talking back in about 63 or 4 is when okay. I started shooting. So. Okay. What, uh, what are some of the regrets, if you have any, about your shooting and maybe some of the lessons learned? Well, there's always a lot of lessons, and most of the time you forget the lessons once you get past them. Uh, so, but for me, one of the biggest lessons to get, to get over was my personal self-talk, how I talked about myself. Oh, I could have done better. I should have done better. Kind of semi-negative. And I... Uh, for me, learning how to communicate with others, how to build other people up, and I found that once I help somebody else get to another level, guess what? You automatically go to another level yourself, or it makes it easier. So it was through through giving and through sharing, mm -hmm. you actually made some of the best progress yourself. Yeah, whether you believe in karma or not, it comes around. Okay. <laughs> Now, what do you see for yourself in the future moving forward? Well, uh, I still have some goals left in shooting uh, next year in 2013 as the next World Championships. 
And one of the reasons I'm so interested in that is that for the first time in a certain number of years, it happens in the United States. Oh, great. It, right it here. It happened down in to Mexico. So uh -huh. I'm anxious to shoot there. I see all my friends from South Africa, you know, Ireland, you know, everywhere, Australia, uh, Scotland. So I, I'm anxious to do that. I'm anxious to compete and just see how we do again. But for the future, I see myself getting as much into public speaking to kids. I really am feeling a passion about getting getting more involved in kids' lives. Uh, you know, I had a high school teacher when I was back in, in high school, and we won't go, necessarily go into the story, but he was pretty instrumental in saving a squad of Marines. He had, and that was just through a, a short conversation with me. I would love it if one day I was able to have some kind of effect on some kids lives like that. Is that a long story Stan? Because I think it is, I think our audience would like to hear it. It is a, bit a long of that. story and it, it, a school teacher saved some Marines. It's a long story but it is uh, sometime maybe we'll go into that. Okay but not today. well that'll be an exciting one to look yeah. forward to. So what kind of advice do you have for anybody who's getting into the sport, somebody who shoots recreationally, who would like to you know, maybe learn to push the envelope with the precision distance shooting? Go, Murray, my best advice would be get involved in the gun club, like you're joining a gun club. Get involved in the gun club, go out and check out the disciplines that you want to try. Oftentimes you're going to find the, the participants of those disciplines so willing and extroverted in helping you become involved in their sport, they want to promote their sport. Uh, if it happens to be long range, which is what I shoot, go to a range that has long range or longer range. It may be an intermediate. Long range is kind of what you define it as. But go there and hang around the long range shooters. See what they ask questions, see what they have, and then get involved. You've got to do it. If you're interested in becoming involved in it, you have to get the stuff, you have to start doing it, and people will drag you along. That sounds like great advice, and I'm going to heed it. You know, I, I learned many years ago, if you want to do something better, you seek expert advice and then you have to heed it. Mm -hmm. Well, Stan, it's been an absolute pleasure it's all mine. spending the day with you. We'll, uh, we'll catch, catch up with you here at the club again in the near future. And if you want great knives, go see Carter Cutlery. Oh, thanks for the plug, Stan. <laughs> oh, I'll show them yours. Oh, yeah. There you go. Practice what we preach. Thanks again, Murray. <laughs>